A Guide to Cardiac Vasoactive Drips, Part 3b, Rescue Agents. Due to the extended length of this material, Part 3 was broken up into two sections. Part 3a covered vasoconstrictors used for refractory shock. We will now move on to Part 3b that will cover rescue agents. What if the cocktail of catecholamine vasopressors vasopressin and steroids is still not sufficient to achieve the MAP goal. We now need to consider using rescue agents. Rescue agents include the nitric oxide inhibitors, methylene blue and hydroxyl cobalamin, and the vitamin cofactors, thymine and ascorbic acid. But first we have to talk about the nitric oxide pathway. What if there's another different pathway that's involved with regulating blood pressure during shock? Well, nitric oxide may very well be the new paradigm. The nitric oxide pathway has recently been discovered to play a new pivotal role in regulating cardiovascular hemodynamics. This new paradigm states that patients with shock exhibit a decrease in vascular resistance through numerous pro-inflammatory pathways including the nitric oxide pathway. The nitric oxide pathway begins with L-arginine being converted to nitric oxide via the nitric oxide synthetase enzyme. Nitric oxide then binds to and activates guanylate cyclase, which is an enzyme that stimulates conversion of cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP then facilitates reuptake and sequestration of calcium, resulting in vascular smooth muscle relaxation and vasodilation. In sepsis or cardiopulmonary bypass, endotoxins and cytokines can be released. This triggers the production of an inducible form of nitric oxide synthetase, INOS. INOS produces excessive amounts of nitric oxide, which then binds to and activates increased guanylate cyclase increasing the production of cyclic GMP and increasing the reuptake and sequestration of calcium and increasing vascular smooth muscle relaxation, leading to inappropriate vasodilation. This uncontrolled vasodilatory state is called vasoplegia. Patients who are vasoplegic are minimally responsive to traditional vasopressors. Therefore, other therapies need to be used, the so-called rescue agents. Instead of causing vasoconstriction, rescue agents block inducible nitric oxide synthetase to prevent vasodilation and reverse vasoplegic shock. Methylene blue is used to treat methemoglobinemia, which is its FDA-approved indication. It's also used as an indicator dye to map out lymph nodes, the parathyroid gland, or ureters and it is now being investigated to be used in vasoplegic syndrome in post-cardiopulmonary bypass patients and in septic shock. The mechanism of action of methylene blue is that it directly inhibits inducible nitric oxide synthetase and the enzyme guanylate cyclase. This prevents the accumulation of cyclic GMP, thereby raising blood pressure by preventing vasodilation. Here's where methylene blue works, blocking these two enzymes to prevent downstream vasodilation. Methylene blue's half-life is about five hours. Its vasoconstrictive effect occurs only during cases when there's upregulation of nitric oxide. It's not normally seen when given to non-critically ill patients. The dosage is off-label and not FDA approved. It's dosed as a 1 to 2 milligram per kilogram IV piggyback given over 15 to 20 minutes, and it may be followed by an infusion of 0.5 milligram per kilogram per hour. Side effects can include hemolytic anemia in patients with G6PD deficiency, serotonin syndrome in patients taking serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and it also can cause a blue-green discoloration of urine, skin, and or mucosa. The blue color can also interfere with the accuracy of pulse oximetry.
In refractory hypotension due to septic shock and post-cardiopulmonary bypass, methylene blue increased mean arterial pressure and decreased norepinephrine requirements. In septic shock, there have only been two small randomized controlled trials. Methylene blue did increase mean arterial pressure, but it did not improve cardiac output, oxygen delivery, or mortality. In cardiopulmonary bypass, there was one randomized controlled trial which found methylene blue to significantly decrease mortality, although this mortality benefit has not been consistently replicated. Methylene blue has recently drawn interest as a rescue medication for refractory vasoplegic syndrome. However, its role remains unknown due to limited data and inconsistent findings. Large randomized control trials are needed. Hydroxylcobalamin is vitamin B12 that we find in food. It's also available in injectable forms. Hydroxylcobalamin injection, 1,000 micrograms per ml, 30 ml vials, and also as cyanokit, a 5 gram ready to use powder vial, which is indicated in the treatment of cyanide toxicity. Cyanocobalamin is the most common oral supplemented form of vitamin B12. It is the chemically synthesized version of vitamin B12. The mechanism of action of hydroxylcobalamin is that it is a potent direct inhibitor of nitric oxide synthetase. It has also been shown to scavenge and bind nitric oxide, forming a cobalt nitric oxide complex that reduces circulating nitric oxide levels. Additionally, hydroxylcobalamin modifies and eliminates the gas hydrogen sulfide, a pro-inflammatory vasodilator that exacerbates septic shock. Here's where hydroxylcobalamin works to block the inducible nitric oxide synthetase enzyme to prevent downstream vasodilation. The dose of hydroxylcobalamin is off-label and not FDA approved. The dose is 5 grams infused over 15 minutes with the ability to give an additional dose. As far as side effects, hydroxylcobalamin can interfere with many lab markers. It can falsely elevate hemoglobin, creatinine, glucose, and bilirubin levels. And it can alter the APTT and prothrombin time for up to 24 hours after use. Hydroxylcobalamin can also cause skin and urine discoloration. It has a deep red color and can cause a dark red-purple discoloration of the patient's urine, skin, mucous membranes, and body fluids. Published data on hydroxylcobalamin's use in shock are observational case reports that are presented below. No harm has been reported with the use of IV hydroxylcobalamin administration. Hydroxylcobalamin shows promise, but further studies are needed. Thiamine, or vitamin B1, is a water-soluble nutrient that is an essential cofactor in the Krebs cycle. Lack of thiamine interrupts the oxidative energy pathway and leads to an increase in anaerobic metabolism and an eventual increase in lactic acid production. Thiamine acts as a cofactor for metabolism of lactate by lactate dehydrogenase, thus improving lactate clearance. So does adding IV thiamine in septic shock improve lactate clearance and improve survival? A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial was published in February of 2016. The trial looked at 88 adult patients with septic shock and elevated lactate levels. Thiamine 200 mg twice a day or matching placebo was given. The findings of the study showed that thiamine administration did not reduce lactate levels after 24 hours, nor did it improve mortality compared to placebo. However, in a small subgroup of patients who had thiamine deficiency, administration of thiamine did improve the 24-hour lactate and reduce the 30-day mortality. However, the sample size of the thiamine deficient group was very small. Therefore, further studies using thiamine and septic shock are needed. Ascorbic acid, or vitamin C, is a new emerging therapeutic option for the treatment of septic shock. Like thiamine, ascorbic acid is an essential cofactor in biochemical pathways. It's involved in two reactions essential for the synthesis of catecholamines. 
Patients with critical illness have been found to have decreased plasma ascorbic acid levels by up to 70%, which can lead to impaired catecholamine synthesis. Let's see how ascorbic acid is involved with catecholamine synthesis. L-tyrosine is converted to levodopa via the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase. Ascorbic acid is involved as a cofactor in this conversion. Levodopa is then converted to dopamine, and dopamine is then converted to norepinephrine via the enzyme dopamine beta-hydroxylase. Ascorbic acid again is involved as a cofactor in this conversion. Finally, norepinephrine is converted to epinephrine via the enzyme phenylethanolamine N-methyltransferase. So you can see how intricately involved ascorbic acid is in the synthesis of catecholamines. The largest study to date involving vitamin C in septic shock was the Merrick study, published in June of 2017. The use of a combination of vitamin C, hydrocortisone, and thiamine was studied in septic shock. Merrick built on the previous reported benefits of corticosteroids and thymine and created a protocol that added vitamin C. It was a retrospective before-after comparative trial involving 47 patients in each group. The treatment group received the so-called Merrick cocktail, which is a combination of ascorbic acid 1.5 grams every 6 hours for 4 days, hydrocortisone 50 milligrams IV every 6 hours for 7 days, and thiamine 200 milligrams IV piggyback every 12 hours for 4 days. Results of Merrick's study were impressive, with clinically significant improvements in all facets of care, including reduced mortality to 8.5% in the treatment group. However, Merrick's study had several limitations. The before-after design led to the use of non-concurrent controls. It was not a randomized controlled trial. It was retrospective, not prospective. It was done in a single center, and there was potential selection of bias in the intervention arm. Merrick's study set the stage for a large North American randomized controlled trial, the Victus trial, which is currently ongoing. So far, subsequent published studies have failed to reproduce results of Merrick's trial. The Citrus Ali trial done in 2019 showed that high-dose vitamin C did not significantly reduce organ failure scores or improve biomarkers of inflammation. The AXE trial done in 2020 found that there was no significant difference in change in the SOFA scores over 72 hours, incidence of kidney failure, or 30-day mortality. It is now up to the large Victus trial to validate or invalidate Merrick's results. The nitric oxide pathway represents a new way to think about how a different mechanism may play a critical role in refractory shock. Septic shock or cardiopulmonary bypass releases endotoxins and cytokines. An inducible form of nitric oxide synthetase is activated and excessive amounts of nitric oxide and cyclic GMP are produced, resulting in an uncontrolled vasodilatory state called vasoplegia. Methylene blue and hydroxocobalamin are nitric oxide inhibitors that act to block this inappropriate vasodilation. Published data for both drugs are mostly small case study reports that show some promise in reversing shock. Thiamine is a vitamin cofactor that may have a role in improving survival in septic shock, especially if the patient is thiamine deficient. High dose vitamin C, a vitamin cofactor involved in catecholamine synthesis, has shown some benefit in improving survival in septic shock in a retrospective before-after study by Merrick. However, subsequent published studies were not able to reproduce Merrick's positive results. Overall, despite favorable hemodynamic effects, none of these rescue therapies have conclusively shown to reduce mortality for patients in refractory shock nor has any agent been proven superior in a large randomized controlled trial. Coming up in part four of this four-part series on cardiac vasoactive drips, we will discuss the use of nitroglycerin and inotropes in acute heart failure 
and define hypertensive emergencies and review vasodilator drips used in its management. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEasy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.